Shalom and uh, praise the Lord. Welcome everyone to class in Romans. Also, I'd like to welcome all our e-learning students who will be listening to this lecture later on. Um, on Monday, we began studying uh, Romans chapter 9, which is a little, you know, different uh, chapter compared to what Paul was basically uh, talking about uh, previously here he's going talking about you know the Jews whether God has forgotten about them are they still in God's plan and purpose what is God's plan and purpose for the Jewish race for the people of Israel uh, are they still in the plan and purposes of God you know now since uh, the keys of authority or the church is now uh, the chosen people whom God has chosen to further his kingdom. So where is uh, the Jewish nation or where is the Jewish people uh, in the midst of all this? Does still God, uh, you know, have a... So we see that Paul is very beautifully uh, talking about this, discussing about this in... Um, uh, beginning chapters 9 and he's going to continue discussing about this in chapters 10 and chapter 11 as well and he's from the very beginning he's making this whole point that you know uh, when God says uh, told Abraham through I and also Isaac that you know uh, through your um, uh, seed or you know says uh, um, it's not through the in verse 7 it says no are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham but, but in Isaac your seed uh, shall be called and verse 8 it says that is those who are the children of the flesh these are not the children of God but the children of promise are counted as the seed so Paul is very beautifully saying and bringing out and quoting Old Testament scripture saying it's not uh, the generation from Abraham and Isaac that are, uh, you know, uh, counted as the chosen generation of those who are uh, the children of promise. But he's saying, but, you know, the children of the promise of uh, are counted as a seed, which means those who receive the promise of uh, being heirs or co-heirs uh, with Christ Jesus or receive the inheritance of being justified and being righteous in God's sight because of their faith in Christ Jesus. He says the children of promise, and it's not the uh, you know lineage or the generations you know or the or through the flesh uh, who would be called as the uh, the children or will inherit the blessing, but it's the children of a promise who will inherit the blessing or will inherit the promises that God had uh, promised Abraham. And so he says uh, that these children of promise can also include the Gentiles, even though they are not, you know, of the Jewish uh, race. So that is what he uh, begins by uh, speaking in verses 7 and 8. And then he talks about, um, you know, um, uh, predestination, God's sovereignty, God's foreknowledge, and um, what we uh, what we see when He mentions that you know the older shall serve the uh, younger. Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have um, hated. Um, and so we saw that it's not that God predetermines our choices, but it's just that He foreknows our choices that we are going to make, and. Um, you know, uh, based on his foreknowledge, he is here already, uh, you know, declaring or stating or, uh, you know, making known, you know, that um, the older shall serve the uh, younger. Okay. And so we, we came right up till verse um, 15, where uh, God says, you know, tells Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on who whoever I will have uh, compassion and uh, verse 16 says so then it's not of him who wills not of him who runs but of God who shows mercy so here again it's not that God is partial that he he uh, shows his mercy and compassion to a few and you know uh, others are subjects of his wrath no but his mercy and compassion extends to everyone and um, 
and his mercy we need to understand when we read this is not selective and partial uh, God is not selective and partial in his expression of being merciful and compassionate but uh, you know he's God who is gracious to all slow to anger gracious compassionate and merciful and he extends his mercy and compassion to um, everyone and so here in this specific context when we're looking at Jacob's life you know what happened in Jacob's life was God's grace and compassion uh, in his that God showed him uh, and it was not a selective or a partial uh, case so uh, the focus is uh, not on the person who makes a choice of saying you know yes to God or yes to Jesus Christ or yes to the gospel that they will receive God's mercy and compassion and the others are doomed for wrath no or uh, here in this case it's not about Jacob who makes the choice of choosing you know a, a, a spiritual inheritance or you know giving that great uh, significance to his birthright that he received um, so it's not the right choice uh, um, that Jacob uh, made and um, and he did what God was pleased with but we cannot say so Jacob was a hero but it was still you know God's mercy that and grace that was extended to him and then in verse uh, 17 he goes to talk about uh, Pharaoh and so we'll discuss about that um, before we we look at um, the rest of uh, chapter 9 and our study on chapter 9 uh, we'll just pause for a word of prayer. So can one of you lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Nobody wants to pray? Okay. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the class we are about to have. God, uh, I just give Selena a moment to your hands. I bless her in the name of Jesus. Fill her with your power and strength and anointing as she teaches us the word, Lord. We just ask that you will help us to open our mind and heart and listen to the word and accept it and be convinced about the truth in our heart, Jesus, so that we can proclaim the gospel boldly. I pray for all my classmates. Give us a good Wi-Fi connection throughout the session. And may your name be glorified through everything. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kefina. So here in uh, this verses, verses 14 to verse 18, uh, Paul is basically talking about, you know, or answering this question, does election mean God is unrighteous? So is God choosing few people, electing few people, Jacob over Esau, you know, choosing some people like uh, Moses over Pharaoh or choosing the uh, the Israelites over Egypt, you know, is God's election meaning that God is uh, unrighteous? So he begins this whole, um, you know, uh, passage or this short uh, portion in, in chapter 9 where he says, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? And then he goes on to rhetorical question. He answers, it says, certainly not. Um, and then he talks about uh, Moses, you know, is God says, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will show compassion on whomever I wish have compassion. And um, and then he goes on to say, you know, Paul says, it's not of him who wills, but not of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. So it's not of Jacob because he made the right choice in choosing his birthright and valuing it and choosing the spiritual things um, and not just giving up his spiritual inheritance for um, for some fleshly uh you know cravings or desires but you know desiring for uh, to be blessed by god desiring for spiritual inheritance for spiritual blessings it says it's not because of the right choice that he made that god was showing grace having compassion and mercy on him but it's because you know um god extended his mercy uh, towards him okay so we look at what uh, he talks about pharaoh in verses 17 and verse 18 so can somebody read that please anyone can read verses 17 and 18 
Romans chapter 9, verses uh, 17 and 18. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whom he will, and whom he wills he hardens. Thank you, Jeffina. So here God raised Pharaoh. Uh, through whom it says, you know, God chose to fulfill his purpose and show his power. Okay. So the question is, did God harden his heart or did Pharaoh harden his heart? Did God harden Pharaoh's heart or did Pharaoh harden his heart? What does scripture say? What does scripture say? Hello, are others there in the class? They should, they should God, others. God has hardened Pharaoh's heart. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Okay. Uh, scripture says that Pharaoh hardened his heart and God also hardened Pharaoh's heart. So we read in scripture that, you know, yes, God hardened Pharaoh's heart and Pharaoh hardened his heart as well. Okay. So if we say that, you know, God hardened Pharaoh's heart, then if God did this, then Pharaoh is not to be blamed. Yes or no? Because scripture says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. So God hardened Pharaoh's heart uh, and he used him to bring about his purposes. So we can't blame Pharaoh. Okay. So how do we understand this? Okay, now going back to Romans chapter 1, we read that God, you know, gave them up to their depraved minds. Okay, God did not make them like that, but he did not prevent them from going that way, which means, you know, they wanted to exchange the glory of God for the glory of man, for the things of man. So if you look at uh, Romans chapter 8, even after knowing, oh, sorry, Romans chapter 1, even after knowing the truth, you know, uh, if you read in, uh, look at Romans chapter 1, it says, um, although they knew God, they did not, verse 21, although they, they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, you know, I know where they're thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. And professing to be wise, they became fools, verse 22. And 23, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanliness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Okay, because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. So it's not that God made them, you know, to give in to vile passions. God did not create them to, you know, uh, uh, to live in all these lustful, vile, evil uh, passions. But it says that, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, God gave them up because they desired to go that way. And we also see that God did not prevent them from going that way because God has created us as free moral beings with a free moral choice to uh, choose. So he says, hey, you want to do that? You want to go that way? You go that way. So here we must understand, you know, this scripture passage in verse verses 17 and verse 18 of chapter 9 in the light of other scriptures, uh, you know, when we read that, you know, God hardened Pharaoh's heart or when Pharaoh chose to harden his heart. So as Pharaoh chose to harden his heart, which means that, you know, he made his own choice to be stubborn, rebellious and not submit to the will and yield to the will of God or to give in to what was God's plan and will for the people of Israel. And so when he chose to stubborn and be rebellious, God gave him up to that way. Okay. So he chose to harden his heart uh, to God, um, that Moses was to the God that Moses was talking about, and the miracles that Moses was doing in the name of the God that you know he identified with or he was sent by.
buy okay so pharaoh said i don't care you know i'm stronger and bigger than your god you know if your god can do miracles i also can my magicians can also do the miracles so since pharaoh chose to harden his own heart uh, god let him do it and that is what scripture means when it says god hardened pharaoh's heart okay you know god cannot do anything that is evil so he can't harden pharaoh's heart which means if he does that you know it's uh, it's something wrong that god is doing and he ceases to be god because god is pure and holy that's outside of his nature he can't do it so when when scripture says that god fa hardened pharaoh's heart it basically means that pharaoh was hard-hearted and god just allowed him to do his own will, go his own way, make his own choice. So as Pharaoh chose this, it only became an opportunity for God to display his greatness and power. So it doesn't mean that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, then to after that to display his own righteousness, his own holiness, his own greatness and power, which means it's failing and it's going against God's very nature and his core being of who he is, he, he doesn't do that. God can, irrespective of people, just show his glory, his power, his uh, greatness. He doesn't have to, you know, harden Pharaoh's heart, then show his glory and greatness and power. But because Pharaoh chose to do this, God just used that as an opportunity to display his glory, his greatness and power. What if Pharaoh had not hardened his heart? We can ask. If Pharaoh had not hardened his hand, God would have still shown his glory, his greatness, and his power. Okay, and then we see that you know, uh, 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 I'm saying Moses. Paul builds on further in this. Uh, we look at uh, verses 19 to verse 24. Um, so it says, "If God elects, why does he still find fault?" So the next part where uh, Paul is discussing, or he knows this question will rise up in the mind of his readers. He's saying, hey, the readers will say, if God is going to elect and choose people, then, you know, if he's choosing and he's showing his power and glory, then why does he still find fault in uh, people when they do wrong? So if God used his glory and power uh, by hardening Pharaoh's heart, then, you know, why does he still find fault with uh, with Pharaoh. So that is a question that can come up in the minds of the readers. But we know that God did not harden Pharaoh's heart. He just let him, you know, choose whatever he wanted to uh, choose, do his own will, his heart in his own heart. And he used him to just show his gl glory and display his uh, power and his greatness. Okay. So verses 19 to verse 24. Can somebody read that, please? You will say to me then, why does he still find fault for who has resisted his will but indeed O oh man who are you to reply against god will the thing formed say to him who formed it why have you made me like this does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor for honor and another for dishonor <coughs> What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had prepared beforehand for glory? Even, yeah, in verse 24 as well, Rosalind, please. Even us whom he called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Amen. Thank you, Rosalind. Amen. So Paul is developing his thought, and hence he's asking another question in verse 19. The question he asks, uh, you know, are uh, the ones he thinks his audience will also ask. He's writing to the Jews and Gentiles. So he's, you know, he's thinking about the mind of the readers and what questions will arise. So he's asking a question which he thinks his audience will also ask. He says, uh, you will ask to me or say to me then, why does he still find fault for who has resisted his will? Okay. So if we say that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, then God cannot find fault with Pharaoh. If God was doing it to Pharaoh, then Pharaoh will have no 
choice. He cannot resist the will of God. So this is, you know, an obvious question that people will ask if this was the way things happened. But we read in verse 20, but indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing form say to him who formed it? Why have you made me like this? So Paul's reply, uh, you know, or he's replying by showing how disrespectful such a question can be. Because first of all, yes, God cannot harden Pharaoh's heart. It's Pharaoh who hardened his heart. And he says, we can't even ask such a question to God because it's such a disrespectful, disrespectful full question. So in other words, you know, uh, he's presenting a picture of a potter, as he explains in the next verse, he says the potter from the same lump of clay, he can divide it into two portions. With one lump, he can create a vessel for honorable purpose, okay, like a nice showpiece that looks very grand, that looks very beautiful. And with the other lump, he can make something simple. Now, as the potter is making these pots, the clay has no say. The clay cannot say, hey, potter, please make, uh, you know, make me for an honorable purpose. Okay. The clay has no say. So in this sense, God is going to, you know, unfold his plan and purposes through uh, different individuals that he chooses uh, in that sense. But like, you know, the difference is unlike the lump of clay, the clay has no free will like human beings have a free will to choose, okay? So God is also unfolding his plans and purposes to different individuals, okay? And um, unlike the clay, you know, that has no free will, we human beings do have a free moral will to choose, okay? So here there is a very interesting intercession or an interplay of God's predetermined plan and man's free will to choose, okay? So for Pharaoh, God had already had a purpose that through the leaders, that is through Pharaoh and Moses, you know, God would display his power and mighty works, okay? So his, and through them, his fame would go throughout the nations and God would deliver his people, or God would fulfill his plan of redemption or the plan that he purposed, um, you know, how he would deliver his people out of Egypt. Now, this was God's plan, and no one could stop God's plan. But, that's not that, but that does not do away with the free will of choice in either Moses' case or Pharaoh's case. Okay, what if Moses said, God, I don't want to go back and speak to a Pharaoh or I don't want to set the uh, Israelites, uh, the, the Hebrew people free out of Egypt. You know, God, that, that would have not stopped God's plan and purpose. He would still have gone ahead and he would still have used somebody else. Okay, now what if uh, <clears throat> Pharaoh had, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, hardened his heart, like Pharaoh had, <clears throat> sorry, Pharaoh hardened his heart, you know, uh, and, you know, if Pharaoh had hardened his heart, would God have been able to uh, fulfill his plan and purpose? Yes, God did that irrespective of Pharaoh, you know, um, making a choice to harden his heart. So irrespective of whatever choice Pharaoh or Moses would have had, God would still have fulfilled his plan and purpose to deliver his people as he had spoken and promised to Abraham. And he would have done it at that time because that was a Kairos moment because he had promised Abraham for 400 years. Of course, it delayed by 30 years because of what Moses had um, done. Okay, So the thing is that the more Pharaoh hardened his heart, it gave more opportunity for the power of God to be displayed. And it gave more opportunity for the fame of God to be known. Okay. Now, since God had purposed beforehand to deliver his people and his plan was being unfolded, um, of course, the election of God was there. The foreknowledge and the predetermining will of his plan was also at work. Yet, Pharaoh had his own choice to harden his heart. Okay. So there was. God's plan and purpose that he had even before the foundation of the world. 
okay it was he was unfolding his election uh, he had foreknowledge of what uh, is going to happen and also he had this predetermining will of his plan uh, that was put to work okay and uh, in spite of all of these things we see that yet pharaoh had his own choice to harden his heart okay so there is this analogy of the potter and clay but there is a difference between the clay and the human beings so what paul is saying in this verse 21 that there are vessels of honor and there are vessels of dishonor or he's asking the question are there vessels of honor or there vessels of dishonor and verse 22 he's saying there is vessels of wrath and vessels of mercy okay so he's referring to people which means he's saying that people end up receiving god's judgment or people end up receiving his mercy okay but it does not mean that god has already predetermined some vessels or some people for wrath and some people for mercy no it's not true because it's you know god is a god who's loving he's uh, god is love he can't hate he love he he loves everyone. So it's not that God predetermined some vessels or some people for wrath and some people for, uh, for mercy. But what Paul is basically saying here is that based on our choices, you know, we end up either receiving the wrath of God because we end up receiving the judgment of God for our actions, the sin that we do, or we end up receiving the mercy of God. God. For in, for example, in Pharaoh's case, and uh, Moses and the, is the Hebrew people, the and the Egyptians, the Pharaoh and Egyptians ended up receiving the wrath of God because they didn't want they were stubborn and rebellious. Okay, and the, Moses and the people of uh, uh, Israel or the, the the Hebrew people, they ended up receiving God's mercy not because they were better than the egyptians but it was because they yielded and submitted to god so in the same case he's talking about jacob and esau okay esau because of his choice ended up with judgment receiving the wrath of god and jacob not that he was perfect ended up receiving his mercy but because of his choice he uh, ended up receiving the mercy of god so in every case, you know, all of them are God's creation, okay? Uh, and it's not that he, they, they were pre-appointed for wrath, but he says in verse 22, God endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Yes, God had already planned that there would be destruction for those who do not receive him or those who do not, uh, you know, continue in their sin. God had already planned that there would be destruction for them. But it was not that he said, okay, you did not receive me, so take this wrath, take this judgment. Okay. But it says he endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Why did he endure with long suffering if there were already vessels predetermined for destruction? You know, God need not have to endure with long suffering if he had already predetermined that hey these people are going to receive my wrath and these people are going to be destroyed the fact that god was enduring with much long suffering the fact that he was waiting for these people to repent and did not want them to end up in destruction shows that he was he's a god of grace and compassion and mercy that he is a god who is patient and long suffering and he's not somebody who's just predetermined some people for wrath and some people for mercy. Okay. So in this whole thing, where does sovereignty come? Um, and you know, God is sovereign, he does what is he wills. And where does the free will of man come? So we can ask this question: hey, where does the will of God come or the sovereignty of God come? And where does the free will of man come? Okay. Now the sovereignty of God is is predetermined. Um, by the purpose which he has, that those who will reject him will be dis destruct, uh, destroyed, okay? Or they will end up in destruction. So God, in his sovereign will, uh, the sovereignty of God already predetermined the purpose, which is those who will reject him will be 
destroyed or be destructed, but that is the sovereignty of God that he predetermined the purpose. But each vessel, you know, or each vessel means each one of us experience God's enduring mercy, long suffering, and God is extremely patient with each of us or each vessel. But if we still don't receive his mercy, if we still don't uh, make a choice, our free will to choose, and we don't choose his mercy, we don't choose his grace, we don't choose his forgiveness, we don't choose repentance and submission and surrender, then we end up coming under the sovereignty of God's predetermined purpose. That is, we will end up being people who have rejected him, and hence we are in a place where we will receive destruction or we will be destroyed. Okay, so it's not God's sovereign will that he has chosen some people for God. No, it's God's sovereign will that he determined the purpose that those who reject him, those who don't yield to him and surrender to him, even after, you know, he shows them or endures with them patiently um, and has mercy upon them and is extremely patient with them, irrespective of that, they in their free moral will choose to, you know, reject him then the end result for them is destruction. But for those of them who, you know, um, uh, continue to be stubborn and hard-hearted, uh, but God is enduring with them, be patient with them, and, you know, if they finally accept him, then they are going to be vessels of, not wrath, but vessels of honor, or vessels that will receive his um, mercy and his compassion okay i hope you understood what i'm trying to say yes so here you know each uh, vessel experiences god's enduring mercy long suffering god is extremely patient with each vessel but if they still do not receive his mercy they will end up receiving what is for them you know what he uh, predetermined or what his sovereign will for them was that you know they will end up in destruction. But God did not determine the choice they will make, but God determined the judgment that they will face. Okay. So similarly, those who receive his mercy, they will experience his glory as we read in verse 23. It says that he, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory okay so those he knows uh, the foreknowledge he has and he knows he knows he's going to choose you know uh, to receive his mercy they would experience his glory so there is a sovereignty of god and the free will of man and both of them come together okay so ultimately god's purpose is still fulfilled while man is going about making his free choice so this is like an amazing working of the purpose of God. So irrespective of the choices you and I make, you know, God in his sovereign will and what his plan and purpose, his plan and purpose will still be furthered. His, he will still fulfill his plan and purpose irrespective of uh, whatever choice you and I are going to make. Okay, verse 24, he says, even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So now he's saying everything I said is not only for the Jews, but also the Gentiles, which means God's sovereign purpose is at work not only among the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. So those who say yes to God become those whom he has called or become those who are vessels of his mercy. Okay, they, they, um, they know the riches of his glory. Um, they would... Uh, uh, receive his mercy so he's saying that those who say yes to god become those whom he has called so going back to what paul was explaining you know god's purpose of what he had spoken to the israelites is not void okay uh, so that means you know the jews are saying hey god gave us the the law the covenants the promises the, the prophets the the forefathers you know, all were us. So, you know, is that all void? Is that of nothing now? So he's, you know, he's, uh, you know, uh, going back to what 
Paul was explaining that God's purpose of what he had spoken to the Israel, Israelites is not void. He was speaking of those of the promise, okay, and not of the uh, descendants of the flesh. He was speaking of the children of promise, and he was speaking of his predetermined purpose that would take place for both the Jews and Gentiles, or to everyone who would say yes to his call. So all those who say yes to his call, all those who receive his call will receive his mercy, will receive his favor, will be part of the blessings of and the promises of Abraham, and will also will be able to experience the glory of God. So in the next set of verses that we will be reading, Paul shows from the Old Testament scriptures that God had already planned and purpose to bring the Gentiles in. That means he's saying, hey, God's plan and purpose for, you know, bringing in the Gentiles to be part of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, which the Jews thought only they were part of the kingdom of heaven. They were only going to be part of the messianic banquet and not the Gentiles. But Paul is saying, hey, you know, the Gentiles also being children of promise is not you know, something that God uh, purpose or plan uh, later on, but it's something that even was uh, spoken of or prophesied in the Old Testament uh, scripture. Okay, so God's plan and purposes was not only for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. Okay, so we read um, verses 25 to verse 29, which you know, quotes uh, the prophecies from uh, the prophet Hosea and Isaiah, quoting how God had already spoken uh, that, you know, the Gentiles will also be part of the promise of part of the kingdom of God. Before we move on to verses 25 to 29, anyone has any questions? Any questions? Is it all clear? Their understanding about predestination, predetermining, sovereign uh, will of God, the free will, choice of man. Everything clear? Any questions? Okay, there are no questions, then we'll move on to verses 25 to verse 29. Can somebody read that, please? As he also as he says also in Hosea, I will call them by me, my people, who were not my people, and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people. There they shall be called sons of the living God. Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness. Because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. And Isaiah said before, unless the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been made like Gomorrah. Amen. Thank you, John Paul. So Paul is quoting from both uh, Hosea and the prophet Hosea and the prophet Isaiah. So it's called quoting from Hosea chapter verses uh, uh, 25 and 26. He's, in these verses 25 and 26, he's quoting from the prophet Hosea that God had already spoken that those who are not called as my people, I will call them my people. So here, those who are not called as my people, referring to the Gentiles, God says he will call the Gentiles as his own people. To show that God had, so Paul is basically showing that God had already purposed that the Gentiles would be called his people and they would be called his beloved and they would be sons and daughters of the Most High God. Okay, so just as how he had spoken ahead of time about Jacob and Esau, and just how he had spoken ahead of time um, that he would set his people free from Pharaoh. In the same way, Paul is saying, you know, he had spoken ahead of time about the Gentiles being his sons and daughters. Okay, so, so you see how beautifully Paul is 
you know, just bringing about his uh, discussion or his argument or presenting um, his thoughts, okay? And he says, at the same time, concerning his own people, you know, Paul quotes from Isaiah saying that though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the a remnant will be saved, okay? Verse 28, for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. Okay, so the remnant will be saved. This passage is quoted from Isaiah chapter 10, verses 22 to 23. It speaks first um, to God's work in saving a remnant from the coming Assyrian destruction. Okay, the suffering of God's people at the hand of the Assyrians and others would make them feel as if they were, you know, would be certainly destroyed. But God assures them that this is not the case, that he will preserve his remnant, okay? So, um, you know, and he says, we would become, uh, have we would have become like Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, Sodom and Gomorrah were completely destroyed when God judged them. Uh, so this quotation is from Isaiah chapter one, verse nine. Uh, it shows us that, you know, um, that as bad as uh, Judah's state was because of their sins, it would have been worse if God had not shown his mercy upon them. If God had not showed his mercy upon them, none of them would have survived at all. And like Sodom and Gomorrah were both totally destroyed, not even a small remnant would be there to carry on, you know, the, the, the generations uh, that were uh, dead. Okay, so even in the midst of judgment, Paul is saying, that, uh, you know, uh, God showed his mercy to the people of Judah, okay? So the, the word, the merciful promise is clear, but, you know, it says if only a remnant will, su uh, will survive, at least a remnant, a remnant will survive and will, you know, constitute the hope of restoration. So here, basically, Paul is presenting two con contrasting thoughts. One is the Gentiles, Okay, um, where we never thought that God had anything for the Gentiles, but you know, he actually planned and spoke that they too will be his sons and daughters. And then he talks about his own people, Israel. Uh, Paul, can you please uh, mute your mic? Thank you, Paul. Okay. So he's presenting two contrasting thoughts here. One is the Gentiles, where you know, uh, where uh, the Jews never thought that God had anything to do with the Gentiles, but we see that He actually planned and, and spoken that they too will be the sons and daughters. And then talking about His own people, Israel, you know, God had to actually do a rescue act. Okay, he had to cut short his work so that some of them can be saved and be with him. If not, all will be destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, so he left, he did leave back a remnant of few people when the Assyrian army had um, uh, invaded, though he said he would, you know, uh, destroy his people, though he would punish them by sending them the Assyrians and the Babylonians, he did save a few, uh, a remnant, a few people he did save. He just showed his grace and his mercy. So Paul is saying that God had already spoken about it earlier when he spoke it to the prophets and God's purposes continues to be fulfilled. And this is what he had spoken and this is what he will do. Uh, fulfilled okay so it says even as he did this in the case of uh, uh, you know he spoke about this um, saying the gentiles will be called as people god is fulfilling that now and that there would be a remnant in his even as he did that when the assyrians had had invaded you know um, so paul is assuring the his jewish brothers hey god is going to has a remnant of jews who have chosen him and he has not given up on his people. He has not forgotten on his people. He would, you know, work with his people and bring them back uh, uh, into the kingdom of God. 
Okay, so what is the conclusion? What is happening to the Jews? And he presents this in uh, in verses 30 to 33. So can somebody read that, please? Romans chapter 9, verses 30 to 33. What shall we say then, that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith, but Israel, Pursuing the law of righteousness has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay it in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Amen. So what is the conclusion? Paul is coming back to righteousness by faith and again talking about how the, the the jews you know the jewish race is trying to pursue uh, righteousness by keeping the law so he's saying the gentiles they have the righteousness or they have the right standing of grace through faith and the jews who had the promises the covenants who had the law you know there's with the forefathers uh, there's where the uh, the promises that were given to, you know, instead of receiving righteousness by faith, are continuing to receive it by the law or by keeping the law. And he's saying, by keeping the law, they cannot. They are going to be a stumbling block. They are stumbling over Christ. Okay, so they are trying to do it in their own means, and they are not able to do it, and they are stumbling over Christ. Okay, so Paul is saying, yes, I have love for my people. I wish they would be saved. But, you know, the only way they would be saved is for them to receive righteousness by, uh, righteousness through faith and not by righteousness by keeping the law. But if they're doing that, you know, they cannot receive righteousness and they will be stumbling over Christ. Okay, so uh, just a brief recap of Romans chapter 9. In Romans chapter 9, we see that Paul says, what is God doing with the Jewish people? He recognized how privileged the Jews are, you know, um, and what about the promises he made to them? He says God is working through the church at the moment. The promises of God haven't failed and will not fail. Uh, he first states that the promise to them is fulfilled through the children of promise that means those who receive uh, righteousness by faith they become children of promise and not uh, the seed but the children of promise and second he says the purposes of God will be fulfilled because God is sovereign he will go about doing what he has purpose in spite of or irregard of man's choices and he talks about Abraham Jacob Esau Moses and Pharaoh and he says the Jews want to establish their own righteousness based on the law instead of receiving it by faith. They want to pursue it by the works of the law. And God is not going to overwrite that. But he says, you know, uh, 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 he's not going to override that. And by doing that, they're going to be a stumbling block over Christ. And this is how he ends Romans chapter 9. Okay. Any questions? Any questions to Romans chapter 9? Okay, uh, there's no questions. Um, we have to have the next set of assessments, uh, assessment 2, uh, which is chapters uh, 5, 6, 7, and 8. So uh, can we suggest a date for that, please? Anyone? Quickly, can we suggest a date? Uh, sometime next week, is it okay? Would you like to have it next Tuesday? Oh, next Tuesday is a holiday for us. Oh, by Bible College will function. Okay, can we have it uh, next Wednesday? Is twenty fifth okay? You can submit it on twenty seventh. Is that fine? Or oh, you want to have it on Monday? What about the rest of the class? Can we have some? So can I post it next twenty uh, seventh? Okay, can I post it on twenty seventh? Then you all can submit it on uh, 
sorry, 25th, and you can submit it on 27th. Is that fine? 25th, and that's you can fine. Okay. Sorry, Paul, John Paul. I was saying it's okay. Yeah, we can. Yeah, it's fine. Okay, what about Paul? Yeah, it's fine with me also. Okay, fine. Okay, so then uh, the next second assessment will be on, I posted on 25th, you all can submit it on 27th. Okay, thank you everyone for uh, joining class. Um, have a blessed weekend. Um, and I'll see you on Monday. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Rosalie.